Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Hey, good morning. Glad, glad, glad to see you. Uh, oh, the message this morning, you've been reading that book. Some of you have been reading, some of you haven't. I got you. Core 52, Mark Moore. Uh, the scripture this past week or this week is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Therefore, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Before that, he said, all authority in heaven and, and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've commanded you. And surely, lo, I don't say lo, surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. I'm glad to be with you here this morning. I don't want to waste your time. I, I want to take some things that someone else said and some other resources. If you would like my resources after the, the service, yeah, come see me. be happy to. I want to use the Bible. I want to illustrate what's a, this whole Great Commission thing. Mark Moore says uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not your mission, it's, it's God's mission, and you get to be a part of it. It's your co-mission. I, I like that. He also says, he also says that it's, um, it's simple. That it's you walking with people as you walk with Jesus. Before you know it, those will meet. I like that. You walking with people as you walk with Jesus, and before you know it, those people are going to meet. I, that's, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, there's a guy named Abraham. You heard of Abraham? Abraham, and I want to give you a slight, you were here earlier. The band, the, thanks for worship, everything. It's good stuff. You're getting the same sermon, but I'll try to slip in a slice for you because I like you, okay? Because I like you. Here we go. Abraham, you heard him? Before he was Abraham, he was Abram. And I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this, okay? God says to Abraham, Abraham. Abraham goes, Yes, Lord. And God says, I want to bless you profoundly. Abraham says, wonderful. And God says, now get out. Get out. Leave your people, leave your place, and, and, and go. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your safety net. Get out of your comf comfortability, but also get out of your convenience and go. Uh, Hebrews 11 says it in another way. Uh, Abraham went. He didn't know where he was going. <laughs> but he went. That's pretty good. The idea is, for God to bless Abraham, God says, the way I do that, this is my business. God says, I make you a blessing. From you, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And then I want that nation to show the whole world my truth, my goodness, and my beauty. From you, I'm going to have a nation. And that nation is going to share to the whole world my truth, my goodness, and my, my beauty. I want the world to know who I am. And I'm starting with you. So get out. Another man by the name of Moses. You ever heard of him? Moses. You can find this in, in, in Exodus chapter 3. Now, he's got life before that. And he's about 80 years old now. My Milwaukee family. Nice to see you. He, he's, he's about 80 years old now. Now, he'd known about the, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's his family. But he hadn't encountered God yet. Finally, in the midst of a bush that wouldn't be consumed by fire, here is this guy named Moses. And he hears God's voice say, Moses, take off your sandals, for you are on holy ground. Now, some of us would say, man, look at that. The presence of God is right there. But can we spin it for just a second? Maybe the whole time, God's presence, his holiness, maybe it was there the whole time. It's finally that Moses, his eyes were open. Heard of a guy named Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 6 starts off something like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe 
filled the temple. Now, I've got to tell you something for those who are, are very much in the literatures and, and for those smart people, you know this. For all of us other people, let me, let me clue you in. When the Bible starts giving imagery of things that aren't about the center, it's because the person most likely can't come up with words to describe it. We find this in Revelation where uh, uh, John is starting to talk about heaven. Is anyone looking forward to that? <laughs> come on. He starts talking about heaven, but he doesn't talk about the throne necessarily. He does, but he, he goes out and out and out. And it's, it's as if he, he can't ever, does he ever describe God? What does he describe? He describes the streets of gold. Why? Because that's about as high as he can get. He just, to, 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 to put God in terms, he, how do you do that? So here's Isaiah. I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and lifted up in the train of his robe. He starts talking about the train of God's robe filling the temple. He said this, he said, there were seraphim, these creatures. They each had six wings. With two wings, they hid their eyes. With two wings, they hid their feet. What's that mean? I don't know, but we're rolling with it. And with two wings, they flew. And it says, one of those seraphim called out to the others. He said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then it says, by the voice of that one, the temple... The, th the thresholds of the building shook. And it says smoke filled that temple. Oh. And then Isaiah finally speaks and he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord of hosts. Oh, man. And then it says that one of the seraphim with tongs, grabs a burning ember out of a fire and flies over. Do you see this? Flies over. He's having a vision of this. Flies over and he takes the, takes the coal and he puts it up against Isaiah's lips and says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And then, to paraphrase, stick with me, it's as if God then says, I got some, I got a job about my business. I need somebody to go to a place where they're not going to like you, they're going to make fun of you, and for years and years and years, they're going to reject the message. Anybody? Anybody? And Isaiah says, put me in, coach. Put me in. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Peter, he's had a rough night of fishing. You like fishing? Rough night of fishing. It's the way he makes his wages. He doesn't catch anything. No food. Jesus is on the scene. Jesus has been preaching from this boat, talking. And eventually, Jesus turns to old Pete and he says, Hey, paraphrasing, things look pretty slim on the farm here. Why don't we go back out to the deep and you cast your net on the other side? And Peter basically says, That nah, sounds stupid. But you're Jesus. I'll do what you say. So he throws his net on the other side after they get to a little bit deeper waters. And it says that when he starts pulling up those nets, the nets start breaking. They start ripping. Because the catch of fish is it's so abundant. Eventually, here's Pete. And he says, Jimmy, Johnny, get over here with your boat. And they get their boat over there. Now you've got two boats trying to pick up. You've, you've been in this situation. Pick up all these fish and both boats start to sink. And then it says this, Peter, he does the woe is me. He says, paraphrase, Jesus, you got to get out of here. He says, I'm a sinner. I'm a man of sin. This, he falls to Jesus' knees and he confesses, I don't think we should run together. In essence. And Jesus says, ah, don't be afraid. I'm going to make you now a fisher of men. And on that day, on that day, Peter quit his day job. This whole great commission, what's this all about? It's God's mission. We get to be a part of it. Yeah. And there's one verb in there. There's other verbs as you are going, but it's the whole idea of I'm supposed to make disciples. What's that mean? What's the gospel? What's the gospel? Well, in essence, part of the gospel is you with your assets and yourself and your gifts, you 
love other people's lives. That's what you do. I want to talk about another person. His name's Jesus. Jesus, like Abraham, was called to go somewhere. But Jesus, it was different than it was with Abraham. You know, a- Abraham, he didn't know where he was going. Jesus did. Where was Jesus going? Jesus knew he was going to his death. That's different. I've, I've wrestled with this for about 10 years. 10 years, all right? 10 years, this idea, the unknown. I haven't come up with much of anything that is more scary than the unknown. Some of you have lived a little bit of life. Some of you have lived a lot of life. And eventually... You or someone you love's been in a doctor's office, and the doctor may have said something to the effect of, we don't know what's wrong. The unknown. At least give me something to go off of. I use this illustration. As a kid, as a kid, mom, can I go to, to Freddie's house? Uh, maybe. Um, give me a yes or no. I can't handle the maybe. That there's, there's, you understand what I'm saying? Jesus was different. Jesus didn't have the unknown. Jesus came down knowing where he was going. He was going to his death. The one thing scarier to me, the one thing scarier to me is than the unknown is knowing where you're going and it ends with your destruction. (sighs) Abraham, yes, Lord. I want to bless you. Wonderful. Now get out. If you want to be blessed by God, he's going to do it in this way. He's going to do it by making you a blessing. That's the business he's in. He's about making you a blessing for other people. You see, God doesn't work like sometimes my corporate mentality. Jesus works in this way. He's, he's all about those, uh, what do you call them? The upside down realities, <laughs> the upside down truths. Jesus is all about the way up is down. Jesus is about, you, you want to be rich, you got to give it away. Jesus is about, you want to gain your life, what you got to do is you got to lose it. You got to put it on the line. If you want to be blessed by God, the way he wants to do that is he wants to do it by making you a blessing. Now to do that, you have to, you have to go. You, you got to get out. Jesus in um, John chapter 17. It's, it's a moment the night before he was to be betrayed. The, the night before he was going to the cross. He's with his disciples. But then he says, hey, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. He doesn't know the master's business, but ah, no, tonight I call you friends. It's almost as if Jesus, paraphrasing, Jesus goes, tonight we dine as friends for tomorrow I die for you. Jesus knew where he was going. And Jesus in those moments, he then prays. He prays to his father and he prays, father, as you've sent me out on mission, I'm going to send these guys out on mission. Just like you sent me out to come here, I'm coming back to you. I'm going to send these guys out on mission. And before that, about five verses before, you find in chapter 17, it says, um, I want them, I'm saying all this to you, Father, because I want them to have my joy. What's... Is anyone married in here? Or have you been married? At some point, I sure hope that you found your spouse attractive. Okay? I don't know about now, but at some point, I hope you found them attractive. What, 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 what draws you to somebody? All right, okay, so in, in romance, it, it, the looks. That's part of it. It's the first thing you see. Looks, got it? Some people say uh, personality. And... They sure aren't that good look, but gum, look at their personality, right? Or man, they, have, they got a personality of a board, but man, they're good looking, right? And there's like, the, can you get someone with both, right? Take romance out of it. What, what makes someone attractive in your eyes? 
I've thought about this a while. This may not be number one, but it sure is close for me. Today it's number one. Ask me tomorrow. Number one right now for me is this, and it has nothing to do with romance. There's something about a mentality. There's something about seeing someone, and you'll, you'll understand when I say it. Here it is. What I find most attractive about any human being is when they know where they're going and they keep on walking. They know what they're about. There's something different. It's, it's the type of person where you can tell they're a big dog. And if you want to run with them, you better start keeping pace or get out of the way. But, but they're moving. Are you with me? It's not the most attractive thing. And it's, it's not that they're reckless. It's not that, but they know where they're going and they keep walking. I want to read a couple scriptures to you out of Luke. Here it is. First one. First one is this, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached, and try to figure out what's all connecting all these. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. 13, verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. 17, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the borders between Samaria and Galilee. One more. Luke 18, 31 through 33. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. It's safe to say Jesus knew where he was going as he was going to Jerusalem. He was taking his disciples up to Jerusalem. On their way to Jerusalem, Jesus was headed somewhere. He was a man with a focus. He was a man on a mission. He was a man heading to his death. Isaiah 53 says this. It says, there's going to be one to come. Now, they weren't calling him Jesus yet. But he's the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who's going to come in and he's going to turn our nation and he's going to let our nation show the world God's truth, goodness, and beauty. But he'll have no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. What? Yeah. He's not going to be that good looking. So what's going to be attractive about him? I'll tell you what's going to be attractive about him. There's going to be something different about him. He's going to be a man, a man who knows where he's going, and he keeps walking. So what does Jesus do? Jesus invites us. He doesn't just invite us. If you call yourself a Christian, he charges you. He charges you to go, to get out, put it another way, to get over yourself. And to be a blessing to others. And also to attempt great things. When Jesus was praying to the Father, there, there's this moment, there's this moment where he says, I want my joy to be in them as well. When you talk about joy, and we sung about it, right? No, up here he was talking on the, the communion meditation. There's something about joy. The most joyful people, have you noticed this? The most joyful people are the people, it's not happiness. The most joyful people, though, are the ones who live life in the upside down rules, in the upside down reality. They're the ones who realize to be rich, you give it all away. They're the ones that realize to go up, you gotta go down. They're the ones that realize to be happy the number one thing is to not focus on your own happiness, but to focus on others. That's. And so Jesus is the person who is all about something bigger than himself. And that's what he's called you and me to be. Bigger than yourself, bigger than your assets, bigger than your romantic life, bigger than your business, bigger than your bank account, bigger than your family, bigger than yourself. And Jesus calls us to come alongside I want to tell you a story. It's about a lady named Mrs. Levitt. 
back in the 1930s. Uh, every Sunday, this old lady, anybody in here consider themselves old? Mrs. Lovett would call up a 16-year-old boy. And she'd call up, not like this, I think it was the, the turn ones, right? The two, two and a short, two rings and a short. I didn't live back then. I you have to go with it. And she would get on there and say, Larry, Larry, are you coming to church today? Now, Larry, he's 16 years old. He lived on a farm. He ran with the mules. He did the chicken thing, the pig. Worked six days a week on the farm at 16 years old. Sunday was his day of play. He could think of a thousand reasons not to go to church with Mrs. Levitt. And he'd get back on the phone and say, yes, Mrs. Levitt, I'm coming to church. And so he'd get up, he'd go to church with Mrs. Levitt, and then she'd say, Larry, Larry, I want you to come over to my house. I'm going to have a Sunday school for you. I want to I show you some things. I'm going to make you a little sandwich and some cookies. I want you to come over to my house. And so Larry, Larry, every Sunday, yes, I'm coming to church. Yes, I'll come over to your house. And she would coerce him with a couple cookies and a sandwich. Now that boy, a 16-year-old boy, eventually he gave his life to Jesus. Eventually that boy, that boy, he eventually married a sweet lady. Eventually that boy went off in World War II and came home. Eventually that boy dedicated his life to God's work. Eventually that couple had four kids And that third kid got married, and then they had a litter of four. And then that third out of that litter is up here this morning talking to you. I'm thankful for Mrs. Levitt. I'm I'm thankful for the reason that... I'm thankful that she got out of her comfort zone. She She didn't let a dynamic of... 80 years old and 16, female and boy, be a roadblock. You know, I, I can't tell the whole story, but there's this moment where Jesus is telling this parable. He's telling a story about um, someone who goes out and throws seed around, right? And, and he says that uh, it lands on four different types of soil. Rocky, um, the weeds, the thorns, the path, and then there's the good soil, And one of the takeaways of that is this. You, as you go and you make disciples, here's the reality. You're going to get burnt. How often? Jesus says, in the long run, 75% of the time. But Jesus isn't like you and me. He's not corporate. Jesus says 25%. That's my success rate. Because he says, when that happens, it'll grow 30, 60, even 100 fold. I'm so thankful that Mrs. Levitt, you know, I, I really wonder, I really wonder. That old lady back in the 1930s, was Larry Larry her first call? Or was he number two, number three? Oh, maybe he was number eight. Or, or maybe 16. What I'm saying is this that old lady decided. I'm going to get over myself and I'm going to jump in the boat with Jesus. So let me, let me, let me make this us. There's the individual. You want to be a blessing. You want to be blessed. You got to be a blessing. You got to take some risks for the Lord. You got to get a, I get that. But let's talk about us. Why am I here this morning talking with you? Uh, It's because your preacher's off on a trip. That's part of it. But you got other people who can do this. The reason I'm here is because I'm partnering with a congregation over on Merritt Island. And I really, I'm jazzed about what they are doing. I really am. Years ago, what they did as the leadership, they went like this. They crack open the Bible and they start to study. And what they found out is this. When they looked at all the letters written in the Bible, 
Church of Thessalonica, to the core, you know, Corinth, you, you got Laodicea, all these different churches. What they found out is this. They found out the closest ones, geographically speaking, about 20, 30 miles. So they started thinking, you know what? Maybe we need to, maybe we need to change some things up. They said this, if that's how it was in the Bible, then what would it be like today? If God was to write a letter, maybe he's left-handed. If God was to write a letter, who would he write it to? Well, who would he write it to, um, to the Christian church on Merritt Island? Or First Christian Church on J.J. Road? Or Sun Valley? Or, to the, or would he go regional? Because in all these cities that these letters were written... There were house churches, people meeting. It's not like everyone, but when God writes a letter, he says, oh, no, no, to the church of, it's regional. So that's where I come in. I'm nothing special. I'm just the person to come and encourage you because you're the church. In two ways, two ways I want to encourage you. Anytime I'm here, these are the two things. These are the two things. The first one is this. I want to let you know, I want you in on something. The first one is this. I want you to know that you're not the only Christians. The second thing is this. I want you to know you're not the only Christians. The first one is this. I want you to know you're not the only Christians. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. It's God's mission, it's my co-mission, and it's my pleasure to be on mission with him. I've noticed this. Somehow, as much joy as I receive from it, I somehow find a way to make it taxing. All I want you to know is this. There's other people in Brevard County on mission for Jesus Christ. You're not the only one. Sometimes we think that, is anyone else out there? Look at the world, where's it going? You're not the only ones in Brevard County. Proximity, preaching for Jesus, baptizing in Jesus, walking with people and walking with Jesus and letting them meet. You're not the only one. I want you to be encouraged by that. Sometimes all we need to know, like John the Baptist, is anyone else out there doing anything? You're not the only Christians. The second thing is this. I want you to know you're not the only Christians. What do I mean by this? This is what I mean. This is really nice. You've, you have history, stained glass. You've, you've got the AC going, pumping. We really appreciate that. Thanks for paying for that, really. You, great things, children's ministry. You, 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 you've got... You, this is, and some of you, and these, it's comfortable, it's all this. Listen, you're not the only Christians. Do not get too hung up on the color of the carpet. You understand what I'm saying? You're not the only Christians. Jesus, when he comes back, he's not showing up to just take you in heaven if I can make a prediction, God's not going to go, all right, the attendance for First Christian Church of Titusville on J.J. Road. All right, you're all here. You understand what I'm saying? No. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. You're a part of his bride. He's taking his bride. In these two ways, in these two ways, you realizing and being encouraged that you're not the only Christians and you also realizing and knowing we're not the only Christians, what this will do is this will help you. This will help you keep trucking along. This will help you get out of your comfort zone. This will help you get out of your safety net. This will help you come out of your consumer mindset. And also what it will do is it'll help you see beyond right here in this location. I'm here to let you know 
God's church is strong. To the church in Brevard County. Yes, Lord. I want to bless you. Wonderful. Now get out. There, last thing, there, there's a statistic. The statistic is July 2021 through July 2022, coming to your great state of Florida were over 1,200 people a day. Now that's domestic, state to state, and that's also international, other countries. 1,200 people. 1,200 people are moving into your backyard. 1,200 people are moving in to be your neighbor. 1,200 people are moving to your doorstep. Now, you can take a certain mindset and go, shove those. They weren't here. They aren't us. Have fun with that. The gospel calls us to something higher. The gospel calls us to go, what a great opportunity. They're coming here. Put another way, Jesus goes, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The one thing I'm going to charge you is that you pray that God will send workers into his harvest field. You want to know what a worker is? You, know what, you want to know what a man on mission is? It's a person who quits thinking about themselves. And it's a person who decides to attempt great things for the cause of Christ. So one more time, to the church of Brevard, yes, Lord, I want to bless you. Wonderful. Now get out. Get out of your consumer mindset. It's hard. That's me. Get out of your comfort zone. The harvest is plentiful. Join me. Get out. Let me pray with you. Our Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for Jesus who doesn't just save us but gives us a role to play. <sighs> thank you that we aren't by ourselves, but that he promises that he's going to be with us and that nothing has more authority than him. So there's nothing that we need to be afraid of. Thank you, Lord, that you want to bless us. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that you'll make us into the workers that we need to be, not the ones that we think we are. And Lord, may May the 1,200 people on the daily who are moving here see a light in Brevard County. And Lord, also, along the way, help us, like Isaiah and Moses, to see you a little more fully so that we truly know what it means to be blessed by our living God. We thank you for Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray.